JFK and why. Big Two has always been dedicated to bringing you the truth. And we've come across some startling information on the assassination of our president. We've spent countless hours researching that information, and now we want to share what we found with you. Beginning tonight and over the next few weeks, we'll take you along on our search for the truth. Who killed JFK? You be the judge as we begin our series of exclusive reports JFK, the West Texas Connection. Almost three years since Ricky White of Midland stood up in a room full of reporters at the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas. He had a story to tell, a revelation that would not only lead every TV newscast in Dallas that evening in August of 1990, but would be the attention-grabbing headlines in newspapers the next day. Ricky White made a startling announcement that would pique interest across the country, that his father was involved in the death of President John F. Kennedy. As cameras clicked away, he told his story, that his father, Roscoe Anthony White, was a CIA operative, posing as a Dallas policeman, and was one of three gunmen that fateful day when the president's motorcade passed through Dealey Plaza in Dallas. He explained to reporters how he said he had learned of his father's involvement that in 1982, he came across his father's diary outlining the assassination plot. I would not share it with anybody else besides myself. When I found the diary, that it was a shocking, most incredible thing that one individual in this room could ever find. Because this guy never gave the impression of being a bad guy. Ricky said all of his information came out of his father's diary, a diary that he says had disappeared from his home after Midland FBI agents looked at it. What I heard today does provide, in some instances, uh, plausible sounding answers to some of those questions. And I think that there's a uh, further, uh, closer look. And though Ricky had researchers backing him up on this story, including those with the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, there were others who were skeptical. There's too many people like Gary Mack and Dave Perry that are out there destroying the last who are they? the researchers because they've made big deals out of well ricky did you graduate from high school even in a big auditorium stand up and say you're illiterate this appearance on inside edition was just one of several ricky would make after coming forward with this story and here too he and wife trisha were attacked you can think what you want, you can call us liars, you can do what you want. We are not lying. Okay, we have to let the American people make up their mind on this. His appearance on Larry King Live would go much more smoothly. What took you five years to give us this diary? It took me a long time to be able to corroborate the story. Ricky would make several other appearances on the talk show circuit. But while he was away telling his story, something happened that Ricky didn't count on. One of the researchers, Joe West, a private investigator in Houston, made a startling announcement of his own, that he had a copy of Roscoe White's missing diary. But what West claimed was the diary was actually a military prayer book, which experts say is a fake. And the media was quick to crucify Ricky White and his story. The Texas Monthly they come out and trash me is because of that fake diary. You know, I don't mind telling anybody it's the truth. My mother created it. You know, if, if it was for attention, money, or what, I don't know, but I know this. I wasn't home taking care of business. I wasn't home trying to be here for my family. Ricky says instead of investigating his story further, the media attacked him. And that's why he's kept a low profile ever since. Mm. I was money greed and all that were, in fact, it's been the truth throughout this whole slide of the story. And the media came after me. 29-year-old unemployed oil equipment salesman from Midland. But in fact, father he did have a job. One blow after another blow after another blow. And then it just wasn't worth it. While Ricky White has stayed out of the limelight, researchers and conspiracy experts on the assassination of JFK have brought his father's story back to life. And in the Oliver Stone movie JFK, the alleged gunman behind the grassy knoll was wearing a Dallas police officer's uniform. Since Ricky's revelation in 1990 and the release of the movie JFK, dozens have come into the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, supporting the conspiracy theory placing Roscoe White as one of the gunmen in Dealey Plaza. 
And while Roscoe White's involvement has gained momentum, another West Texas connection to the JFK assassination has surfaced, this time in Crane. Researchers are checking out leads that guns stolen from a ranch in Crane County may have been used to assassinate Kennedy. They asked me if I had had some guns stolen out here at any time. And I said, yeah, there were two guns stolen, a 22 and a, a 35 Remington that were taken out of the barn. I said, well, what's the connection here? And they said, well, we think these two guns may have been used in the assassination of the president. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Is there a reason you didn't tell anyone about this before? Investigation had been so that they had a man that was fixing to uh, blow the whistle on this whole thing. And I said, well, who is it? And they said, well, we don't want to tell you. But they said, we want you to keep silent until you hear about this on TV. Revelations like this one from Crane County rancher Calvin Smith are why the JFK Assassination Information Center opened its doors in Dallas. We'll take you there tomorrow night at 10. And here's a question to think about until our next report. Did JFK's assassins practice their craft in West Texas? You need to watch tomorrow night at 10. Midlander Ricky White says his father Roscoe was in the Marines with Lee Harvey Oswald, the believed lone assassin in the killing of President Kennedy. Researchers checked out his story and believe his father was involved. Big Two went on its own journey and found what could be the place the assassins would practice their mission. Tonight, we continue our series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. most notorious murder mystery and 30 years later we're still not sure who killed president john f kennedy so many unanswered questions has led many to believe a conspiracy exists and that's the reason behind the jfk assassination information center in dallas which opened its doors in 1989 it was here at the center in the late spring of 1990 that ricky white of midland walked in and told workers his father killed jfk when ricky came to the center in the spring of 90 uh we said, why do you think your father killed John Kennedy? And he said, well, I found his, uh, his diary, his journal, and he said he was one of the shooters behind the picket fence. We said, well, let us see the diary. He said, well, I haven't got it. The FBI took it from me. And we thought, well, we had another coup kit, but we haven't come in all the time. Howard says even though Ricky couldn't come up with a diary, he didn't come to the JFK Center empty-handed. And I just showed you the documents where Lee Harvey Oswald and Roscoe White left on the same ship together to Japan. He said, my father joined the Dallas Police Department in October 7th, 1963. And he was in the police academy in you know, January of 1964. So he was with the Dallas Police Department during the assassination. On the police academy photograph, when he graduated from the um, police department, uh, he was number one in his class. That's why he's sitting in the middle of the class. But what really caught their attention, Howard says, was that Ricky mentioned his mother, Geneva, had worked for Jack Ruby and showed a photograph of the two together. This photograph surfaced in 1988 in Time magazine. Just happened to pick one at random from a group of photographs no one ever seen. Ricky told how his mother and father had met in Paris, Texas, and that when his father got out of the military, they ended up in Dallas. He said his father went to work for the Dallas Police Department, and his mother was hired by Jack Ruby to work as a rail girl at the Carousel Club. Researcher and former co-director of the JFK Center, Gary Shaw, says all of this adds up to more than a coincidence. But it's significant that Roscoe White uh, was an ex-Marine who served duty with Lee Harvey Oswald, was an expert marksman, came to Dallas shortly before the assassination and acquired a job with the Dallas Police Department, actually seven weeks before the assassination, while his wife went to work for Jack Ruby. And uh, you don't find uh, a much better connection than that. While some researchers look to the events right before the president's assassination, others believe the plot to kill Kennedy started much earlier, when he was first elected president. Kennedy entered Washington in 1961, immediately surrounded by a den of enemies. Many CIA agents were upset over the Bay of Pigs fiasco. 
Kennedy's brother Robert inflamed the mafia over his crime busting as Attorney General. And the president's threat to pull out of Vietnam, many say, would have cost the country billions of dollars. While the conspiracy theories point in different directions, some say the gunmen involved with the secret mission trained here, near Van Horn, where we sent Big Two's Mike Gibson in search of clues. Three hours on the road so far, and we're just now pulling into Van Horn. It's near this small town where we hope to find evidence that assassins trained for one of the biggest assignments ever, the killing of John F. Kennedy. Ricky White of Midland says his father, Roscoe, took the family on several supposed hunting trips to Van Horn back in 1963. Okay. White produced this copy of a family postcard from March of that year to at least prove he and his dad were in Van Horn at this time. White believes these trips were really an opportunity for his dad and other sharpshooters to practice for the Dealey Plaza murder. We've arrived on the ranch where we now are searching for a cabin, some sophisticated radio equipment, and a canyon. The ranch owner tells us there is a cabin down this road, but there is no radio equipment there. We find the cabin camouflaged by trees, so secluded that if you didn't know where to look, you probably couldn't find it. I have along with me Eddie Owen. He served in the National Guard during the 1960s as a radio technician. Both of us are wondering why powerful radio equipment would be out here to start with. We hope that if we find it, it will help prove covert operations may have at one time gone on here. A quick search of this shack in back of the house and look what we find. Look, transmitter. An old transmitter. In the early 1960s, G.B. Well, Brock of Odessa well, served as the chief of communications for the National Security Agency. Brock was in charge of 400 people whose job it was to intercept radio messages from around the world. Brock identified the radio equipment as being made by a Kansas City company. It was built before World War II, primarily for export to South American countries. When I first saw it, I thought, well, this is an illegal operation, I'm sure, out there in Van Horn. What else was far? And there's nothing legal out there going on that you would need that type of communication. And I don't know what the purpose of that would be if it wasn't an antenna. Now, that um, antenna is headed towards Mexico City. I mean, it's a directional type of antenna. And uh, I have books that's got that same type of antenna. Time now to take a look at the canyon where we've been told assassins trained. Ricky White says he went back to this ranch several years ago, and when he looked out over this area... It was too scary because I arrived, and have you ever been at a place that you know you've been there? Much of what you've seen and heard in our story could at one time been found on the big screen. These are scenes from the movie Executive Action. The only possible scenario is three rifles with triangulated fire. This early 1970s production had a short-lived run. It was yanked after showing for two weeks at theaters. Maybe this movie got too close to the truth. Ricky says this scene is how he remembered seeing his father on a hunting trip. Seven seconds and two misses. It's probably a kill, but we're two seconds over time. So who shot JFK? Well, if you believe what you've seen and heard tonight, the answer may lie within this canyon. In Van Horn, Mike Gibson, Big Two News. At this point, researchers continue to look into this as a possible West Texas connection and the plot to kill Kennedy. And think about this, how can you accuse someone of murder before the crime's committed? Experts say that's what happened to Lee Harvey Oswald. Be sure to watch tomorrow night at 10. Why do so many of you believe there was a conspiracy behind the assassination of JFK? The reason researchers say there are too many bizarre circumstances that led to a conspiracy. And when the West Texas connection first surfaced in 1989, many experts say that connection filled in a lot of missing pieces to the Kennedy assassin puzzle. Well, tonight, a look back on the day that will never be forgotten, November 22nd, 1963. Another part in our continuing series of exclusive reports JFK, the West Texas Connection.
bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. I think rogue elements of the CIA killed him with the mafia as a junior partner and using Oswald as the patsy. Oswald never fired a shot and it was covered up from the very top. Larry Howard, who's the director of the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas, will be spending the rest of his life looking for evidence to solve the assassination of John Kennedy in November of 1963. Howard, like other researchers, believe more than one gunman was involved. They believe the deadly shot killing the president came from the Grassy Knoll area. Midlander Ricky White says his dad, Roscoe White, who worked for the Dallas Police Department, fired the fatal shot. My father is the famous Grassy Knoll assassin. He is the Dallas police officer that participated behind the Grassy Knoll that fired the two fatal shots into Kennedy. I do not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald fired any shots or killed anybody that day. You truly believe Ricky's story? I believe Ricky White is telling the truth. As the president was rushed to Parkland Hospital and the drama of trying to save Kennedy's life was underway, minutes after the shooting, Dallas police say they have a suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. But as Big Two's Deanne Holcomb has discovered, researchers say the circumstances surrounding his arrest are questionable. Lee Harvey Oswald fit the description of the man seen on the sixth floor of the school book depository building where Dallas police say was the scene of the crime. There a rifle and shell casings had been found. It's believed Oswald fled the depository and ended up at the Texas theater, although no one really knows why. That's where police arrested him. At this point, some researchers say the facts just don't add up. They say Oswald was wanted for killing Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett at 1 p.m. That's when newspaper reports say the announcement went out over the police radio. But that's 15 minutes before Tippett was gunned down. White says his dad also killed Tippett. They were taking somebody to Love Field, which would have to be Oswald. They were all three in the car at the time, and then, then, then nobody knows what took place inside the car because we weren't there. But a commotion took place. Oswald jumped out and ran. That's the reason why he was seen in the vicinity. My father jumped out of the car to chase Oswald down, ran back in the back of the alley. When he couldn't run him down, he came back to the car. Now, what are you going to do with Officer Tippett at this time? You're going to shoot him. Reverend Jack Shaw, a longtime friend of the White family, says he was told Oswald was set up. In uh, meeting with Geneva about uh, three years ago, um, some things came back to her memory that she shared with me. She said that they were down at uh, Jack Ruby's place, and Roscoe and Jack Ruby were in this room talking, and she was overhearing a conversation of the plan to assassinate President Kennedy. Oswald was Patsy. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. I'm just a Patsy. As Oswald sat in jail, not yet charged with killing the president, over at Parkland Hospital, a fight would break out over Kennedy's body between Secret Service agents and local authorities. Dallas doctors had wanted to perform an autopsy. The Secret Service wanted Kennedy's body flown to Maryland. There was a lot of pushing and shoving and grabbing the casket, and several times they, they pulled the casket completely off the truck. While the country mourns Kennedy's death, Oswald is blasted away by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby as Dallas police were taking Oswald to another place for questioning. He's been shot. He's been shot. The Oswald has been a year later, the Warren Commission would announce to the world Oswald was the lone gunman in the murder of JFK. It claims only three shots were fired coming from behind the president's motorcade. Many disagree with the lone gunman finding. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was at Parkland Hospital and was one of the doctors trying to save the president. It was obvious to me that something had been done to cover up uh, the wounds that we had seen at Parkland to go along with uh, the position that um, 
Obviously, Harvey Oswald had been the lone shooter, and they'd shot him from the school book depository. I ended up up in the uh, uh, school book depository, and I walked over to the window next to the one Oswald was supposed to have used, and I looked out at the kill zone out there, and having been a sniper in Vietnam and um, having several uh, body count of my own, I could see exactly what had happened. It was a headshot from the front. I know. I've made them. Here are a few more facts for you. In 1969, Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry told a news reporter, quote, We don't have any proof that Oswald fired the rifle and never did. Nobody has yet been able to put him in that building with a gun in his hand, end quote. And several witnesses that day in 1963, including Dallas policemen, encountered men with Secret Service identification at Dealey Plaza and the Grassy Knoll area before and after the assassination. Yet, there were no agents specifically assigned that day in the area. Our series continues Monday night at 10. Midlander Ricky White says he has not only had to face the details linking his father to the plot to have President John Kennedy killed, but tonight, for the first time, it's revealed his mother may have known about the conspiracy and was forced to keep quiet to stay alive. Ricky remembers his mother turning from a caring person into someone he didn't know. Well, tonight, the conspiracy continues in our series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. Reverend Jack Shaw of Dallas says he first met Roscoe and Geneva White in 1970 in Richardson, one year before Roscoe would be fatally injured in a suspicious fire where he worked. Roscoe was uh, the manager of the, I think, the Emmy Moses store at the time, and they came and visited the church, and then after that, then I visited their home on several occasions. There was a time when, when Geneva was was upset and Roscoe called me in later to visit with her and talk with her. Shaw said through his counseling sessions with Geneva, he learned that in 1963, Roscoe had arranged for her to work for Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club, but that she only worked there for a short time. Roscoe had set that up for her to, to work for Jack Ruby as a part of uh, the whole, his whole plan uh, in the assassination. She was only there for, according to her, for two weeks. And uh, that's when it all blew up, and, uh, they had, and Roscoe got her out of there. Shaw says Geneva confided in him that she had overheard a conversation between her husband and Ruby, plotting to kill the president, and that she heard names mentioned, including Lee Harvey Oswald, Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, and others. Oswald was patsy, and um, he was... Um, he was he was just fulfilling a role. Um, she said she overheard this? She, she, she overheard the plan that included Oswald and um, included others. And she overheard uh, what part uh, Roscoe would play, what part Jack Ruby would play, that sort of thing. Uh, Roscoe did not want uh, Tippett involved because he, he, couldn't, he couldn't trust him. Uh, according to what Geneva's told me, that later uh, proved itself to be true because that was the uh, that was the, the scene where uh, Roscoe and uh, Officer Tippett uh, had a disagreement about uh, how Oswald was to be handled, and uh, that Roscoe uh, shot Tippett. Shaw says Geneva recalled Roscoe saying he didn't want Tippett to be involved, but Ruby did, and that Roscoe had known Oswald for some time. I had found a Time magazine and had an article in it about, I had to do the Jack Ruby and stuff. And it was that photograph yeah, right there. I, I called Ricky and I said, this, I'm about this, this Time magazine. I said, and this looks just like your mother standing in this picture. Yeah, that's my mother standing right in front of Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club. In that same magazine, they published a photograph of my father and Lee Harvey Oswald mm -hmm. in the Philippines. Ricky says this only added to his belief that his father was involved in the murder of President Kennedy in 1963. First reading his father's diary in 1984, which outlined the assassination, and then coming across a picture of his mother with Jack Ruby. And then you took both to your mother? Right. And she... Confronted her that... that that that's her, that's Jack Ruby, this is this, this is that, and, and then by doing that, confronted her and pushed her over to the edge where she, 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 she's known all these years. I mean, it's, it's sad. 
Shaw says after Ruby discovered that Geneva overheard his conversation with Roscoe, he told Roscoe his wife would have to be taken care of. Uh, Jack said that she had to, you know, that she had to be put to death and Roscoe and, and Jack worked it out where she would be given shock treatments. And uh, so she, according to her story, she was given shock treatments uh, at that time. That was the, that was the deal that was made when uh, she was, she was over, she was overhearing her conversation through Jack Ruby and my father and Jack Ruby saw her at the corner of the door and had realized that she'd been there longer than, than necessary to take care of the problem after the, Senate, the Kennedy assassination be done, that she would promise to go through electrical shock treatment, and she did. And we she have went. documentation from her psychiatrist? She went through four electrical shock treatments within about a two-year period. And they were making her do this? To, to relapse her memory, to, to, for what reasons? Because she still had that memory still locked in her mind. It just, just disordered her completely. I mean, my mother, from day to night, Becky changed. I mean, from the mother that I knew to a nightmare that would go on. I mean. Tomorrow night at 10, hear how Roscoe White was injured in a suspicious fire, a fire that would take his life. As we continue our exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. was Roscoe Anthony White. According to his son, Midlander Ricky White, he was one of several gunmen who took part in the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. Ricky says he learned of his father's involvement after reading it in his father's diary. Reverend Jack Shaw of Dallas says he recalls visiting with Roscoe and his wife Geneva on several occasions and that Roscoe talked about serving in the Marines and working for the Dallas Police Department. Reverend Shaw says he began to learn even more about Roscoe's identity after Geneva told him about a trip she had taken to New Orleans. She said that a man approached her, claiming he knew about Roscoe's involvement in the assassination. And to tell Roscoe, he had 48 hours to get in touch and respond. Geneva flew directly home to warn her husband and was very upset. That's when Roscoe called Reverend Shaw and asked that he come to their home right away. Geneva said you were called to our home because I had uh, had requested Roscoe to bring you over and I'd asked Roscoe to tell you everything and uh, he could not bring himself to tell you and the reason he couldn't was for fear of your life. But Shaw says what Roscoe did tell him was enough to spark anyone's curiosity. That Roscoe told of his background as a Marine and as a Dallas police officer. And that wasn't all. As he talked about being a policeman, he talked about, he talked about wearing a wig um, and disguising himself. The way I was picking it up is uh, for undercover purposes, and, and I don't know. I mean, that was the impression that I got. I, I had no idea what he was doing, had done with the police force, but um, he sure he sure let me know that he was doing more than just normal police business. And he showed me some pictures that were very intriguing. Um, and I, I, I don't want to talk about who they were, but I've seen a picture of him with some top government officials, and I could not understand that. Are they still alive today? Um, at least... Yes, I say at least one of them is. Shaw says he doesn't know if Roscoe was connected to the CIA, but that he has counseled with many people who are. Yes, I would say there was some, you know, there was some ambiguity about the things he was saying that uh, that did cause questions in my mind. Um, but you have to remember that I was much younger than I am now, and I and. And I didn't have the I didn't have the experiences that I have today. You know, I, it was a strange thing uh, at at his funeral. Uh, uh, there, you know, there were a lot of a lot of people there that I, you know, that I, I couldn't imagine Roscoe uh, being acquainted knowing the people. But your father died in 1971. It was, it was in 1971, and it was at Eminem Equipment Company in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he had gone across the street for a break, had went over there with another gentleman, Dick Adair. 
and when they had returned back to the work area, he had reached down to pick up a torch to fire it off. And then somebody had came in and cut the settling hoses where the bottom part of the floor was filling up with settling. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the fire just igniting, starting the fire. There was a gas can placed up underneath the, the bench, which was the secondary fire, which engulfed him. Roscoe was taken to Parkland Hospital's burn unit, where he lived for about 24 hours, and Reverend Jack Shaw was with him when he died. He said uh, that this wasn't an accident. Uh, he had come back from break, either break or lunch, and uh, that he had seen someone uh, leaving uh, the building. And, uh, Seems like he said uh, they were dressed in a suit and had a briefcase. I, I got the impression he knew who it was, uh, but he did not identify that person to me. Shaw says before Roscoe died, he cleared his conscience for taking lives on foreign and American soil, which is documented at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. This is Roscoe White's death certificate. He died September 24, 1971. After the fire, which he was burned over 95% of his body, the third degree burns, on his deathbed, he told his pastor, Reverend Jack Shaw, that he had killed many people on foreign and domestic soil for his country. At the time, he thought it was right, but now he knows it was wrong. Well, God forgive me, and the man died. Roscoe Anthony White was buried in the Field of Honor at Wrestling Memorial Cemetery in Dallas. I will tell you this. Um, and this is the first time that I've, I've said this uh, to anyone um, publicly, and that's that uh, I was contacted by a person um, stating that the, the information I have would, would be very important. And there, would, there was uh, money available to, to pay me if I would uh, turn the information over to them, no questions asked. And uh, to that person, uh, I said, um, that kind of sounds like a setup to me. The person who approached me said that the person that, uh, that I was to contact had been with the FBI, but was no longer with them. If you decided to do this? If I decided to, to take them Wanted up take on this somebody. offer. Mm -hmm. Okay. My answer to him was, if there's a, you know, if, <laughs> if there is a, uh, you know, if there's anyone has any interest of, uh, of silencing me, uh, let's short circuit all of this, and, and if, if there's any money to be made, go ahead and take a contract and put me to sleep and, uh, and be my friend and get it done. <laughs> there was silence on the other end of the telephone. <laughs> Tomorrow night at 10, our series of exclusive reports continues. You'll hear how the House Select Committee learned of Roscoe White's possible involvement in the Kennedy assassination as early as 1978, but didn't follow up on it. That's tomorrow night on The Update. The American public, shattered by the assassination of a president in 1963, would experience even more chaos in the late 60s. The Vietnam War escalates, civil rights leader Martin Luther King is slain, and Robert Kennedy is assassinated in Los Angeles as he's campaigning for president. But these events couldn't prepare our country for what it's about to see. In 1975, 12 years after his murder, the American public would be shocked when it sees a film showing John Kennedy's execution. And for Midlander Ricky White, this same year, he and his mother would be questioned by Washington investigators looking into the alleged conspiracy behind Kennedy's assassination. Tonight, we continue our series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. Viewer discretion is advised. Yeah.
And President John F. Kennedy is getting a warm welcome this morning here in Fort Worth, the third stop in his whirlwind trip through our state. After it's 1973 when this movie Executive Action, starring Burt Lancaster, hits theaters across the country. The movie is based on the book Rush to Judgment by author and Washington attorney Mark Lane. This Hollywood version of the assassination of President Kennedy would for the first time allege a conspiracy. The Secret Service are under regular orders to stay with the president no matter what happens. Once they get him to the hospital, they'll probably filter back. But for at least a half hour, you should be entirely free of them. I'll have six men with Secret Service credentials in Dealey Plaza. Their insignia for this trip, incidentally, is double white bars on red. Lane, who wrote the screenplay, says orders from upper management forced him to take out any CIA connection in the plot. Lane says the movie was a financial success, but short-lived. Two weeks after its premiere, it was pulled out of theaters, and by six months would completely disappear until 1991, when it was released again, this time on video. But whose order did the film get pulled? Lane says no one knows for sure. Let's now fast forward to 1975. Allegations of a cover-up explode when Americans see for the first time Kennedy's execution. It's called the Zapruder film, shot by Abraham Zapruder, who captured the president's arrival in Dealey Plaza. As the car came down, the last shot hit him almost directly in front of us. Researchers say as you look closely at the film, it shows the probability Kennedy could have been shot by a bullet fired from the front. Although he didn't know it at the time, in 1975, the same year the Zapruder film was released, Midlander Ricky White would have a brush with his father's secret identity. An identity he says he now knows as the gunman behind the grassy knoll. In 1975, in Paris, Texas, there was a break-in in where Ricky White and his mother lived and the people that broke in stole a box of material, assassination-related material. In this box of material were all of these photographs that Roscoe White had. Howard says the men who burglarized the Whites' home were arrested in Arizona with the stolen photos still in their possession. The police took the material out of the car. They realized it was assassination-related, so they informed the FBI. The FBI comes in and lo and behold, here's a photograph of Oswald no one's ever seen before. A year later, in 1976, the stolen photos turn up in Washington, D.C., in the hands of the newly formed House Select Committee on Assassinations. Members of the committee travel to Paris, Texas, to talk with Ricky White and his mother. Out of the blue, they ask Geneva White if she's ever worked for Jack Ruby. She denies it. In 1978, a family friend, who we will call John Doe, warns Ricky that the House Select Committee is going to peg his father as the number one shooter in the Kennedy assassination. Ricky doesn't believe him, but when the committee volumes, Roscoe White's name is mentioned in the investigation. So even in 78, the House Select Committee knew about Roscoe White, but never followed up on it. And though Geneva White denied it in the late 70s, what reason would the House Select Committee have to ask if she had ever worked for Jack Ruby? We may never know. But what we do know is that more than 10 years later, Geneva would admit to Ricky that she in fact had worked for Ruby in 1963, just prior to the assassination of the president. That revelation came after her picture was spotted in a magazine with none other than Jack Ruby. Tomorrow night at 10, a man believed to have been involved in the conspiracy, who we'll call John Doe, confronts Ricky, Midlander Ricky White, about how his father is about to be fingered as the trigger man in the plot of Kennedy's assassination. You won't want to miss it. Those who know who he is will not speak his name. But what we've been able to find out about this man is intriguing. Millinder Ricky White says this family friend came to him in 1978 with a warning. Ricky says that warning was that the House Select Committee on Assassinations was about to key his father, Roscoe White, in the murder of President Kennedy. So who is this man? And why does he claim to know so much? Well, tonight, our series JFK, The West Texas Connection, continues. Ricky White's father, Roscoe, died in 1971 after he was burned over 95% of his body 
in what Ricky says was a suspicious fire. Ricky says seven years later, in 1978, a family friend told him his father was about to be implicated in the Kennedy killing by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And at that time, two weeks after our visit, they did come out with a verdict that they were 99% sure that they was a grassy no assassin. I mean, they couldn't prove who he was or where he came from, but they knew that there was a man standing there at the grassy you knoll. Still, Ricky says he didn't believe his father's friend, who we will call John Doe, to protect his identity. He had just got out of the hospital. He had been shot twice in the abdomen and had probably been left to die. And this person, John Doe? Yes, it was a very good friend of my father's before he died. Ricky says he didn't believe what John Doe told him that night in 1978 until 1985 when he started reading his father's diary. When I came across a part in the diary which was leading up to the assassination mm -hmm. and then that's when I realized that, that John Doe was telling me the truth. Ricky says his father's diary didn't become interesting until he read up through the year 1960. And then from 1960 on my father lived a very interesting life, a, a double life than anything that I ever knew of him. Can you uh, tell us some specifics? Um, not on record, I can't. I mean, the, uh, there's known things that my father was involved with, but, but I'd rather just stick with the John F. Kennedy. Although Ricky chose to reveal little about John Doe's identity, Reverend Jack Shaw, another family friend, did tell us what Ricky's mother told him about the man. That person had been doubling uh, for Oswald to give Oswald um, to give Oswald an alibi, uh, or to set Oswald up related to being in another location, specifically. Uh, uh, in Mexico, coming out of the Russian embassy. I, I got the impression that he was flying in from somewhere else. Uh, not just him, but others were flying in and would be in place for taking care of the assassination. Could this man possibly be John Doe? Yes. Sources close to John Doe tell us that since he learned of our plans to report on the Kennedy assassination, he has disappeared. If I tell you the John Doe's name, and if I'm right, will you tell me more? Well, if you'll turn that camera off, where will you talk? The camera was turned off, and my photographer was told to leave the room. But the name I gave Reverend Shaw, he says, was wrong. So as of this moment, one of the missing links in this story is the true identity of John Doe. Now remember, it wasn't until Ricky White found his father's diary that Ricky says he believed John Doe was telling the truth, that his father was involved in the Kennedy assassination. But Ricky says it's been difficult to prove. He says the one piece of concrete evidence he had linking his father was taken away. Ricky claims that after the Midland FBI learned of the diary's contents, an FBI agent, apparently on orders, took the diary from his home. You'll hear both sides of that story tomorrow night at 10. Plus, a Midland DA investigator tells about his trip to Dallas in search of the truth. Only when he got there, he wasn't alone. Watch tomorrow night at 10. Tonight we continue our series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. In 1971, Roscoe Anthony White, a former Marine and at one time a Dallas police officer, died after a suspicious fire in Paris, Texas. It would be years later before his son, Ricky White of Midland, would come across his father's military footlocker. Time would pass before Ricky would really examine the contents of that box, but when he did, his life would change forever. Among his father's possessions, Ricky found a small black diary. In it, he says, were the shocking details of his father's involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy. Ricky says his father used code names to refer to himself and others who positioned themselves in Dealey Plaza that fateful day in 1963. His code name was Mandarin, and the other gentleman's name was was Lebanon, the guy that was in the book depository, and Saul was located in the records building. 
Also among his father's possessions, Ricky says, were a bank bag, a key to a safety deposit box, and a receipt for $200,000. He claims his father, Roscoe White, Jack Ruby, and Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett all had accounts at this bank. When Ricky and his mother Geneva checked on getting into the safety deposit box, bank officials told them they would have to probate his father's will, giving them power of attorney. But Ricky said that would have cost a lot of money, money he didn't have. And that's when Ricky says he asked Midland DA Al Shorey for help. This, it led on Al wanting more information, more information, and more. Him and J.D. Lucky came to the house three or four times and sat on the couch and went through everything and looked at everything and read everything. Time, I mean, I know three times. Like, I know they came over three times and went through mm -hmm. the same stuff. Everything, Ricky says, except his father's diary. Um, did uh, J.D. Lucky or Al Shorey touch that diary? See it, open it up, look at it, no. anything in mm. your house? No. Why was that? No, I kept it at a distance. I always did. I never did hand it to anybody or give it to them. The people that ever did ever see it or did read it did it without my permission. One of those people Ricky is referring to was employed as a babysitter. She agreed to an interview, but only if her identity was kept secret. Did you see the diary? Have you ever seen the diary? Yes, I have seen the diary, but at the time I did not know. I just knew it was a book that I was not supposed to be looking at. I remember seeing names, and but I couldn't tell you the names. I remember seeing numbers. Ricky says two Midland FBI agents also looked through the diary without his permission after they came out to his house demanding he bring any assassination-related material he might have to the Midland Federal Building. It was Butler that introduced himself first to me. And then Ron Butler? Ron Butler. And Ferris was standing beside him. And, and I tried to book him a little bit, and, and uh, I kind of pissed Butler off. And before I know it, he's pulling out a federal book, said, young man, not only do I want you to read it, I want you to read it out loud where I understand that you understand what I'm saying. You know, intimidate I, me. I've spoken to Ron Butler. He told me on the phone that he didn't, was never at your house, has no idea where you live, never been there. That's a no. downright lie. That's a lie. The babysitter confirms Ricky's version of the events that day. Why can't we reveal your identity? Because I'm calling the FBI liars. And they know it and I know it and I know what happened that particular day. And so we're just afraid for us. We're for me and my family. The babysitter and Ricky remember loading all of his father's material, including the diary, into a box. And the two FBI agents followed him to the federal building. Ricky says he and the two agents were the only ones in the room, but that a man on a speakerphone asked a lot of questions. He said the two agents referred to the man as Arlen Specter. He is the Pennsylvania senator who had served on the Warren Commission. It was the Warren Commission that determined that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman in the Kennedy assassination. They keep going over and pounding me about how my father is a thief. He stole these photographs. He, he made this story up. He, Ron Butler says, well, we better get, we better get photo stack of copies of it. So he goes over to a Xerox machine and there's Xerox and everything that was in that box. So they had a Xerox copy of the diary? Yes. Every page in Yes. It. Ricky says he then loaded the diary and everything back into the box and drove home. Ricky's wife, Tricia, says Ricky was extremely upset when he got home and that he put the box containing the diary on their pool table and headed for the bedroom, vowing he was through trying to prove his story because no one would believe him. Here I thought that the FBI was um, people that you would look up and moderate as being Trust. trustful people. And here they let me down. Minutes later, the doorbell rang. And he said, hi, uh, I was an officer with Ricky while I gone with the FBI and I left my notepad in the box of stuff he brought home. And I said, and I guess you need to get it. And he said, yeah. And I told him, I said, we'll just follow through there and it's back on the pool table. So I went back there and by the time we got to where the door was, Ricky said, who is it? And I turned and went to the doorway. I didn't go in the bedroom, I just went to the doorway. And I said, it's somebody with the FBI. They said they left their notepad in the box. And as soon as I turned around, he was facing me. He said, thank you very much. I got what I needed and walked out. And I, I contacted the head of the Midland FBI, Tom Kersville. Kersville was more than cooperative in giving me an official statement on the matter. And while he was not stationed in Midland when all of this happened, he said, quote, we did interview Ricky White. He did bring documents to us. The FBI did not take them from his possession. The documents and interview were of no value. We never saw a diary, and one has never been in our possession. 
and the denials of the FBI that they did not see or did not take the diary, uh, from my experience with, uh, with that agency, just don't wash. If Ricky White's story is worthless, then why in January of 1988 did the FBI send a special agent to accompany Midland DA investigator J.D. Lucky around Dallas in his search for the truth? Lucky had gone there to look for a safety deposit box in which Ricky White believed his father had stashed $200,000. Did the FBI accompany you, on, accompany you on this trip? They did. Did you go and uh, oversee or look at these areas? The night, at a time? yeah, the night before, and that next morning, uh, we went to these banks and savings and loans to see if those if that key that uh, would work in those uh, safety deposit boxes. It did not. Um, you were aware of a secret document on the city of Dallas Police Department. Investigator Lucky said that the FBI had met with Ricky Blank, had seen the pictures and diary. Is that correct? I never said that. Uh, I, the FBI, to my knowledge, never saw the diary. We never saw the diary. How do you think they could uh, make such a mistake on this? I mean, I mean, is that easy for... Like they would want to the only thing I'd down. say is that he may have misunderstood me. When our attorney first contacted uh, one of the agents in Midland, he said he almost threw up on the table. And I think that's the approach they've taken about this entire story because it's very disturbing to them that, uh, that this is all coming out. I contacted the Dallas intelligence officer who filed the report on Investigator Lucky and read him the part where he says Lucky made the statement that the FBI had met with Ricky White, had seen the pictures and diary. He told me, quote, if that's what it says in my report, that's what I was told. My reports are accurate. We also obtained the handwritten notes made by Officer Beavers before the report was typed and turned into the captain overseeing the intelligence division. The handwritten notes match up with the report. So you decide, was there a diary? And if there was, did the FBI take it? JFK, the West Texas Connection, continues Sunday night at 10. Our story takes us to Crane. Were the guns stolen from a ranch near there used to murder President Kennedy? Find out Sunday night at 10 on the Weekend Update. When we come back, Jay Gordon Lunn and your weekend weather forecast. A 30-year-old unsolved burglary or part of a plot to kill President Kennedy, a Crane County rancher and his father don't know what to believe. They hadn't given much thought about the two guns stolen out of their barn in the early 60s. After all, that was almost 30 years ago. The guns were gone, the case never solved, so they thought that was the end of it. And it was, until a few years ago when a private investigator from Houston and another man showed up asking lots of questions. Questions the rancher and his father have kept to themselves until now. They asked me if I had had some guns stolen out here at any time. And I said, yeah, there were two guns stolen, a 22 and a, a 35 Remington that were taken out of the barn. I said, well, what's the connection here? And they said, well, we think these two guns may have been used in the assassination of the president. And I said, you've got to be kidding. But the two men were not kidding. They were acting on a tip from an informant who they say had ties to the mob. Joe West, a private investigator from Houston, and Gary Shaw, then co-director of the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas, were the two men who visited the Smith Ranch. They had been working extensively on this case for some time when information led them here. Uh, Joe West and I made the trip to Crane, Texas, because of information we had from a, an informant, a man who uh, had organized crime ties, who said that prior to the assassination, he stole rifles from a ranch near Crane, Texas, and delivered them on orders to Jack Ruby in Dallas. And it was a, he was of the opinion that uh, at least a part of those weapons were used in the assassination of the president. Although Shaw would not release the informant's name, he did say he was a large black man who at one time was a heavyweight contender and fought the likes of Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. It was a big track, so it must have been a pretty big man that did it. The first thing I noticed was the barn door being open. 
I noticed that the guns were gone out of this pickup. The door on the pickup was open. Could the person who left the footprints along this fence line really belong to Weston Shaw's informant? We felt that there was truth to what the man was saying because of his background in, uh, in the criminal network. The Smith Ranch wouldn't be the only stop private investigator West would make in Crane County. The former sheriff says he turned up at his office as well, asking a lot of questions and wanting to see that burglary report on the stolen guns. The sheriff told him he'd be more than happy to oblige, only that report had disappeared. Becky, I have no idea where it is. We, we have uh, looked and looked. We've gone back in our old records and looked, but we just haven't come up with a lot of reports as far as that goes. The informant told Shaw and Wes that three of the guns he sold to Jack Ruby were high-powered, very accurate hunting rifles. Far, far superior to the throwdown gun, which is what I call the 6.5 Manlicker Carcano that Oswell allegedly used, which was a piece of junk. Pandemonium, but total confusion at this point. Hardly anyone who was more than 30 or 40 feet away from the presidential limousine realized that the president had been shot. It'd uh, be hard to believe, though, that our one of our guns could have possibly done that. Is there a reason you didn't tell anyone about this before? They told me, they said, uh, we, we want you to understand that uh, we would like for you to keep this silent. That they had a man that was fixing to uh, blow the whistle on this whole thing. And I said, well, who is it? And they said, well, we don't, we're not going to tell you. But they said, we want you to keep silent until you hear about this on TV. A year later, at a Dallas news conference, Midlander Ricky White made a startling announcement that his father, Roscoe Anthony White, a former Marine and Dallas police officer, took part in the Kennedy assassination. As Deanne Holcomb reports, Ricky's news came after he made a chilling discovery in Paris, Texas. In July of 1990, Ricky White says he discovered something he believes his father had hidden away in the event of his death. In fact, what he would find inside his grandfather's burned-out attic was so unsettling, Ricky says he couldn't tell anyone, not even researchers at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. In the metal container, uh, well, I told you the items that were in there. Now, Ricky kept this book here and wouldn't give it to us. And we couldn't understand why he wouldn't give it to us. If the orders are in there to kill John Kennedy, what could be worse than killing John Kennedy? Inside the canister and wrapped in plastic, Ricky found three decoded cables with orders to kill John Kennedy. Pictures of Ruby shooting Oswald, Roscoe White's dog tags, and this mysterious green book. These are copies of the cables found in the plastic. It said remarks, Mandarin. Now when Ricky first came to us, he said the diary said his father's code name was Mandarin. Well, lo and behold, it's Mandarin on the cable. It said foreign affairs assignments have been canceled. The next assignment is to eliminate a national security threat to worldwide peace. Destination will be Houston, Austin, or Dallas. Contacts are being arranged now. Orders are subject to change at any time. Reply back if not understood. C. Bowers, OSHA. At the bottom it says RE-Rifle, code AAA, destroy. The second cable says same information at the top. It says remark Mandarin code A, Dallas destination chosen. Your place hidden within the department. Contacts are within this letter. Continue on as planned. The third cable dated December 1963. says stay within the department. The witnesses have eyes, ears, and mouths. The next word we can't decipher. Due to the mix-up, the men will be in to cover all misleading evidence soon. Stay as planned. Wait for further orders. And though the cables would be considered possible evidence in the death of our president, the worst was yet to come. What Ricky couldn't bring himself to talk about with anyone could be found inside the Green Book. Researchers call it the Witness Elimination Book, where Roscoe White had listed those he had murdered. This is two pages out of the Green Book. It's a uh, shorthand book turned upside down, starting in the back, and then newspaper clippings glued onto each page. The picture on the left is of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. If you notice, John Kennedy has a slash across his head. That means he's dead. Oswald's dead, and undoubtedly the girl on the right is dead also. But Robert Kennedy's not. Now, the significance of this at the very bottom, 
it says, Godhead going after tail later, which means probably Robert Kennedy. And sure enough, he was assassinated later. Now that phrase was not known until 1980. That's what Carlos Marcello said to one of his uh, mob figures. We got the head now, we're going to have the tail later. In the back of the book, it says 28 people died under witness program and then a series of numbers, which we don't know what they mean, and it's signed Roscoe Anthony White and his signature. It wouldn't be until how... Los Angeles to meet with movie director Oliver Stone that Ricky would tell Howard about the green... No, Howard says they met with Stone and he offered to buy the rights to the Roscoe White story. They never mentioned the book that Ricky had taken with them. And as far as accepting Stone's offer, Howard said they turned him down. I said two reasons. One, the story's not fully investigated yet. It's got some flaws. And two, we're scared to death. If these cables we have are legitimate, there's only four of us in the world that know where they are and who has them, and we feel our, li our lives are in danger. Howard would later work for Stone as the conspiracy consultant on the movie set of his controversial blockbuster, JFK. It was before they left the Los Angeles airport that Ricky gave Howard the Green Book. And as their plane approached the Dallas airport, something would go terribly wrong. The plane was coming down, almost touching the runway, and they gave full power and took off again, which is very unusual. It was a 767. It circled the airport two or three times and landed at a remote runway that we didn't even know existed. Howard says the flight attendants told them to evacuate the plane down the chutes immediately. So, you know, we're thinking, oh boy, what, you know, what is this? And I'd taken the green book because Ricky had given me the green book at the L.A. airport and I'd looked at it and put it in my briefcase. And it was in the overhead rack. So while people were trying to get out of the plane, I was going the wrong direction because I was going to get the green book out because the diary is already missing. So I got it out and stuck it in my pants. Fortunately, Howard says he and Ricky <laughs> safely without injury. But there were others who weren't so lucky. We were standing there. That car drives up FBI. They're circling the plane. There are men that got out. The plane is sitting there with nobody and nobody around it. And these special government cars drive up. So we get at the airport. We finally get back to the center. And I call a friend of mine that works at Delta. I said, what happened on this flight? He said, a bomb threat was called into the uh, LA airport when y'all took off. And in the newspaper article, it says the FBI searched the plane. Ricky says a small group of independent oil men in Midland now own the rights to the Green Book and are having it researched. He says the book is locked up in a safety deposit box or vault somewhere around the tall city. probably haven't seen many pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald, the man tagged the assassinator of President John Kennedy. That's why tonight's segment is so important. You're going to hear from researchers who believe the photograph of Oswald given to the news media after Kennedy's murder in 1963 is a fake. The picture shows Oswald holding a rifle as he's standing in his backyard. Some researchers now say that famous photo is actually Midlander Ricky White's dad. Roscoe White. As we continue our special exclusive series of reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, look and listen closely. The man you're about to see may not be the man lawmen say killed JFK. Today, Jack White has returned to the home where Lee Harvey Oswald lived in Dallas before he became known as the assassin of President John Kennedy. White is trying to recreate this famous photograph of Oswald holding a rifle. In 1963, this picture was flashed on television sets across the country as Oswald was branded JFK's killer. You people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. During his interrogation by Dallas police, Oswald told them the photo was fake. These incriminating photos of Oswald's were fakes, just as he tried to tell the Dallas police. He thinks the man posing in the picture is Midlander Ricky White's father, Roscoe White. Notice that the person in the backyard photos has a broad, flat chin, while these pictures of Oswald show him with a pointed cleft chin, not at all like the one in the backyard photos. Now look at the chin of Roscoe White. 
Whose chin most closely matches the one in the backyard photos? Oswald and Roscoe White were in the Marines together, trained at a CIA camp in Japan, and would end up living close to each other in Dallas before Kennedy's assassination in 1963. Roscoe White had just been hired on at the Dallas Police Department. These close connections, plus investigative work by Jack White, has convinced JFK researchers the photo could be Roscoe White, not Lee Harvey Oswald. White was about the same height as Oswald. In fact, there were many physical similarities between the two, with the exception of the neck and chin. Roscoe had a thick neck with big sloping shoulders, while Oswald had a thin neck with narrow shoulders. When I enlarged the photos of Oswald and Roscoe to the same size and laid one over the other, I was astounded to find that the height, posture, and even some features are an identical match. Also, it is known that Roscoe suffered a broken right wrist which never healed properly and left a slight lump on his arm. Oswald had no such lump. In this backyard photo, there's a noticeable lump on the figure's right wrist. It certainly seems to me that the figure in the photo could be that of Roscoe White. Jack White, a photo analyst and commercial artist in Dallas, has been working on this fake photo theory for nearly 30 years. He believes Roscoe White was put in the Dallas Police Department by the CIA to make sure Oswald was set up as Kennedy's assassin. I believe Roscoe White was placed on the Dallas Police Force to help frame Oswald for the assassination. When Oswald was arrested, two photographs of him with a gun were found. However, suspicion over the photos grew after a burglary in 1975 at Ricky White's mother's house in Paris, Texas. That's when a third Oswald photograph turned up. Ricky says somehow this picture and others made its way into the hands of Washington investigators looking into the Kennedy assassination back in 1976. Ricky thinks this may be one of many reasons why he and his mother Geneva White were questioned about the photo by investigators with the House Select Committee. And the shadow under Oswald's nose is straight down at 12 o'clock, but yet the shadow on the ground is at 10 o'clock. The shadows don't match. And on photograph number two, we have the rifle pointing at about 11 o'clock, but yet the rifle in the shadows pointed at 9 o'clock. It doesn't work. But the significance is that Roscoe White had a third pose of Oswald that no one else had. And it's been proven by experts that these are fake photographs. As part of the fake photo theory, Jack White was called to Washington in 1976, and he too would be questioned by the House Select Committee. This is one of several dozen photographs the Dallas police claimed was found in Oswald's belongings. Apparently it is a photo Oswald took while in the Marines. Uh, there are other photos of Marines and photos of Asian cities. In this photo of Oswald's Marine buddies, I found one person especially intriguing. After comparing the man in the fatigue cap in the center with many photos of Roscoe, I'm convinced they may well be photos of the same man. This fake photo conspiracy is on display at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. Director Larry Howard also believes the photo of Oswald is really that of Roscoe White. The fake photo conspiracy would be one of many closely examined by movie director Oliver Stone as he prepared for his controversial movie, JFK. The movie released in 1991 was an instant blockbuster. As a consultant and right-hand man for Stone, Howard provided him with over 400 photographs, 20 videotapes, and several witnesses connected to the Kennedy assassination. One of those, Oswald's widow, Marina. And we've done more for this case with the movie JFK than all us researchers in the last 30 years put together. He's the one responsible for having the files open today. Was there one man or three who shot and killed John Kennedy? Well, those who believed there was a cover-up questioned how many gunmen were involved and how many bullets were fired. Tomorrow night, a doctor gives his account of what he saw in Trauma Room 1 at Parkland Hospital that fateful day, November 22, 1963. JFK, the West Texas Connection, continues tomorrow night at 10. Many say there was a conspiracy to kill President John Kennedy in 1963 and have it covered up. One doctor says there was a medical conspiracy as well. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Charles Crenshaw kept silent about what he saw at Parkland Hospital 
or Kennedy was brought in after being shot in downtown Dallas. The reason he speaks out today, Crenshaw says the autopsy pictures of Kennedy have been altered. As we continue our special series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection. Tonight, Big Two's Deanne Holcomb takes a look at the medical journey into how Kennedy died. The Bulletin, this is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. All I can say is where is the wound in the back of the head that 27 people saw that's not in the autopsy pictures. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was 30 years old and a resident doctor at Parkland Hospital on the day President John Kennedy was taken there after being gunned down while riding in his motorcade in Dealey Plaza. As a trauma doctor, he would be used to treating gunshot victims, stab wounds, and victims of car accidents. But none of this had prepared him for seeing the President of the United States lying on a gurney, hanging on to life. People in suits were running around. Uh, people were crying. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, problems with the perimeter. The FBI didn't know the Secret Service and vice versa. I got to see the, the entrance wound before he made this incision through it. And then, of course, the tracheostomy tube was put in place. He still was not breathing well. What was going on? Was it just total silence? What, what was happening? There was very little said because it was such a uh, gripping moment. Uh, I think we did our procedures rather quietly, kind of like a team. Everybody was working to get an airway going, uh, to make him breathe correctly and establish circulation. But there wasn't a lot of talking at all. Do you remember what you were thinking at that time? Well, I was thinking that I'd trained all my life to be a surgeon, and here was a traumatic wound to the press of the United States, and I couldn't do anything about it. The assassin's bullets had done more to kill Kennedy than Crenshaw and the other doctors could do to save his life. But his toes were exposed, and I'll always remember Mrs. Kennedy as she came in with Admiral Berkeley. She stopped and kissed his right great toe before she went forward to hold his right hand and to listen to the mass that was being given by the uh, priest there. And then he was given the uh, last rite. I was thinking about uh, all, all of the, our world had just been changed by a couple of gunshot wounds. The United Press reports that the president died at 1.35. That Chaos at Parkland Hospital would continue as word spread of Kennedy's death. And then I was surprised that they got the Justice of the Peace, Theron Ward, from Garland to drive into Parkland and to sign the death certificate and to um, uh, release Kennedy's body in the face of being told by Dr. Rose that it was against the law, it was against Texas law, and they were, could not move the body. And the phalanx of guards, I don't know who it was, looked at him and said, we're taking this body out with the Secret Service. This is the President of the United States. And I really believe that um, they, were, they were rolled over on top of Dr. Rose. Tired, depressed, and in shock over the President's death, Crenshaw was even more amazed at news reports that there was a lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, responsible for killing Kennedy. The reports also told how the bullets fired from Oswald's gun hit Kennedy from behind. But that's not what Crenshaw saw in Trauma Room 1. The feeling of all of us was that the bullet wound had gone in the throat here, the lower third of the throat, with an entrance wound from the front. And likewise, I felt that the wound in the back of the head was a tangential shot behind, the, above the hairline, here, right in the right rear of the side of his head. You could put your fist in it. While Crenshaw questioned this latest revelation, never in his wildest dreams did he think he would come face to face with Kennedy's believed assassin. But that's what would happen. Crenshaw and other doctors would be ordered to go to the emergency room. As Crenshaw walks in, he sees Lee Harvey Oswald. Here, two days later, Oswald was hanging on to life after being shot by Jack Ruby. He had an operating team ready to go immediately, and his anesthesia was pure oxygen because he was in extreme profound shock. He did, have, he had no pressure, but he did have a pulse. 
Inside the operating room, Crenshaw is tapped on the shoulder and asked to take a phone call. Picked up the phone, and this voice, like thunder, said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. How is the accused assassin doing? And I said, well, he's lost a lot of blood, but he is holding his own. He said, there is a man in the room, and I want him to be able to take a deathbed confession. Oswald wouldn't have been able to talk even if he'd survived. A code of silence took over at Parkland Hospital. The reason, Crenshaw says fear of the unknown surrounding Kennedy's death is why many of the doctors, including himself, decided to keep quiet. He says the scope of corruption to cover up seemed so powerful that he, like the others, feared for their medical careers. In 1991, when Crenshaw was at the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas, he saw for the first time the original pre-autopsy pictures of Kennedy, taken at the hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, where the autopsy was performed. Crenshaw was outraged at what he saw, and he promised he would not be silenced anymore. And I believe he'd gotten shot twice from the front. The second one being from the side uh, as a tangent above the hairline, hitting uh, in the, behind the right ear, knocking out the size of a baseball out of the right rear part of the president's head. And for me, if you see the back of his head intact, I think that was just an incredible experience. Crenshaw kept his promise, and in April of 1992, his book, JFK, Conspiracy of Silence, was published. Today, Crenshaw, at the age of 60, has retired from Chief of Surgery at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, mm -hmm. although he still goes into work part-time. As Crenshaw reflects on his career and success as a surgeon, those three days in 1963 will always be a part of his mind, heart, and soul. Quietly to himself, Crenshaw will always wonder why Kennedy had to be assassinated, throwing our country into one of the darkest moments in history never to be forgotten. Deanne Holcomb, Big Two News. As our special series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, continues. Tomorrow night at 10, it's back to Van Horn and more information on the radio equipment believed to be a part of what the assassins used as they prepared for the plot to kill Kennedy. And witnesses come forward with information about the conspiracy. That's tomorrow night at 10 on the Big Two News Update. Tonight, we bring our series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, to a close. But due to overwhelming response from you, we will continue researching what we found out and will update you in the coming weeks. During one particular segment of our series, we sent Big Tooth Mike Gibson to Van Horn. That's where Midlander Ricky White remembers going with his father on what he thought were hunting trips. But this is the same place some believe Kennedy's assassins may have trained. On his first trip to Van Horn, Mike Gibson discovered what experts say is high-powered communication equipment. And recently, you made another trip back there, Mike, at the recommendation of local law enforcement officials. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks. Uh, Becky, I did travel back to the ranch where we first found the radio equipment. We'd been warned that if we didn't go back and try to get the radio, it would soon be gone. So we uh, went to the ranch owner, and he agreed to let us take the items and bring them back for close examination by our radio equipment experts. We now have the communication system in a safe place. We hope that the high-powered equipment can be hooked up and tried out. Now, if this can be done, maybe we'll be able to find out for sure what the communication system was used for. Reporting from the newsroom, Mike Gibson, Big Two News. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Since our series began, we have received important information, not only from researchers across the country, but from people right here in the Permian Basin who have watched our series and have come forward to tell us what they know. And to all of you, thank you for what you've shared with us. And now, part 12 of our series, JFK, The West Texas Connection. It's been almost 30 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and while America was told Lee Harvey Oswald was the man responsible for his death, not everyone would believe it. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, to assure the survival and
and the success of liberty. So I've searched and searched for 30 years trying to find out, find one small item that would convince me that Lee Harvey Oswald did it as the government said. it. That doesn't exist. And the evidence points to multiple shooters, therefore a conspiracy and a cover-up, which means somebody's in control of, uh, of what we know about this. And if they're in control, then uh, we need to be concerned, and I am. Researchers believe that Midlander Ricky White's father, Roscoe Anthony White, was one of several gunmen that fateful day in Dealey Plaza. JFK Assassination Center director Larry Howard served as the conspiracy consultant to Oliver Stone on the movie JFK. I was the one that positioned the gunman in Dealey Plaza. It was my job. And I put the gunman, one of them, behind the picket fence. The house looked to me, said someone was. The witnesses said someone was. And the Roscoe said he was, because he marked in the green book where he was standing. The green book is what researchers call the witness elimination book, believed to be a list of the people Roscoe White had murdered. Researchers say the fact that Roscoe knew Lee Harvey Oswald and had served with him in the Marines, that Roscoe had joined the Dallas Police Department just prior to the assassination, and the fact that his wife Geneva once worked for Jack Ruby, add up to more than just a coincidence. But proving it, they say, has been difficult since everyone involved has died, including Roscoe and Geneva White. But Howard says there's still hope that someone out there knows something that will tie it all together. If we solve this case, it's going to be someone walking through the door just like Ricky Wine did and telling us what they know. Howard says after Ricky first told of his father's possible involvement in the assassination during a news conference in 1990 and the release of Oliver Stone's movie JFK a year later, more and more people have called or come into the center to tell what they know. The first man that came to me used to work in the CIA. It was in on the Bay of Pigs invasion. And in the summer of 1963, he came to Dallas and tried to buy some guns from Roscoe White. They then went together to see General Walker, who was living in Dallas at the time, to try to get some financing for the projects that we're working on. Howard says another man owned a nightclub, and he walked into the center with his wife, telling Howard Jack Ruby was his best friend. He said in, in November, early November of 63, Jack Ruby brought someone into his club, said, I want you to meet a good friend of mine, Roscoe White. next man was a witness from Denny Plaza. He was across the street from the old man from Bruder was filming, and he fell to the ground when the shots were fired, and then he hammered on behind the picket fence where he heard the shots come from and the puff of smoke, and he was encountered by a Secret Service man with Secret Service credentials telling him to get away. Uh, the man had a rifle stuck under his coat. He was shown 10 photographs. Of the 10 photographs, he picked one out as being the man that encountered him, and it was Roscoe White. Howard says another witness said she was filming in Dealey Plaza that day and was panning toward the grassy knoll. And her camera was confiscated by the FBI the next day, and the film never been seen. But she saw Roscoe White walking down the steps from the grassy knoll area to Elm Street after the shots were fired, and she recognized him as Geneva's husband, because she, she worked for Jack Ruby herself. The next witness came forward, he's a principal at one of the high schools in Dallas, and was chosen to go on the shuttle flight that exploded if that girl had gotten sick. Very credible. And he was best friends with J.D. Tippett's son. And he said three weeks before the assassination, a man came to the Tippett house and they got in an argument with J.D. Tippett, and it was Roscoe White. He saw his picture in the Texas Monthly Magazine in December of 1990. Roman and her daughter came to sit one night about 10 o'clock. I said, uh, I need to tell you something. I said, what's that? I said, I was um, working for one of Jack Ruby's attorneys. Matter of fact, I was married to him. And he was one of Jack, Jack, Jack Ruby's first attorney. And before the assassination, and after Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald, Roscoe White was at our place every day, before and after the assassination arranging what we're going to do with Jack Ruby. One other witness, a woman, phoned Howard but told him she was scared to come to the center. When he met with her, Howard says she told him that her stepfather was one of Roscoe White's best friends and that Roscoe would come to their house to play cards. She said back then her stepfather was the director of one of the major funeral homes in Dallas and he was also a reconstruction artist on bodies. 
And at 12.35, on November 22nd, he was called from the funeral home and said he had to go directly to Parkland Hospital. But on Friday night, he didn't come home. Saturday, he came home very late and packed the family up and then drove to Austin, Texas, which he called a safe house. And stayed, there's a guy that, was, that ran the safe house, had a big red beard, and had anti-Castro Cuban posters all over the walls. Sunday morning, they got up early, drove to San Antonio, he made the kids play out in the yard and watch TV. When Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald, he went out the yard, said, we can go to Dallas, now it's safe. The woman told Howard that she believed her stepfather altered Kennedy's body and later helped Roscoe White dispose of those who may have known or seen too much. What makes it interesting, her stepfather was arrested in 1975. Now remember, he's a director of a funeral home, a, a expert in his field. He's arrested for conspiracy to commit murder. He tried to kill, kill the wife of the deputy sheriff. Tried to burn her to death. Hit her in the head with a hammer first, then set her body on fire. Well, she survived in I beat him. And he called on the phone to his wife's stepdaughter, said, I'm, de I'm in trouble, I need to see you. And they met with him for about 30 minutes, but he wouldn't tell him what for. Then he was arrested. In 1975, the day he was gonna go to trial, as they were walking from the jail, the criminal courts building to the courthouse, he was shot in the back by a police officer and killed on the day of the trial. When Howard contacted the man's attorney, he says the attorney would not discuss the man or the incident with him at all. Howard says he has signed affidavits as well as videotaped each person who has come forward with information and that he has obtained 65,000 signatures at the center to have this case reopened in Dallas. We're in the process now of going to trial in Texas, in Dallas, about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, where it should have been investigated the first time. It was a Texas murder. In 1963, it was not a federal crime to kill the President of the United States. It is now. It's still on the books in Texas because there's no statute of limitations on homicide. So we have the right to do this ourselves through a grand jury investigation and subpoena the people that should have been subpoenaed in 64 and 76. So that's our, our intention this moment. And who does Howard believe was behind the plot to kill Kennedy? I can tell you what I think with the information I have. I think rogue elements of the CIA killed him with a mafia as a junior partner and using Oswald as the patsy. Oswald never fired a shot and it was covered up from the very top by J. Edgar Hoover, Alan Dulles, and Lyndon Johnson. And that's how it happened. This is what, what I know. I think the, the puzzle is, is that here it is almost 30 years after the crime and we still don't know who killed our president and that our government has done everything within its power to keep us from knowing it. They have covered up the evidence, manipulated the evidence, destroyed the evidence, and uh, they continue to do so even to this date. On August the 6th of 1990, the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, Texas, had a news conference that went worldwide. We had Ricky there to tell his story about his father, Roscoe White. The next day, in the newspapers in Dallas and all over the world, the CIA, the FBI, and the Dallas Police Department said Roscoe White was a nobody. We filed under the Freedom of Information Act to find out if this nobody had any FBI documents on him. If he was a nobody, he shouldn't have any. But the FBI did have information on Roscoe White, a total of 46 pages. 26 of those were withheld because they were classified. And out of the 20 pages researchers did receive, 19 had been blacked out. It's there, it's hard evidence. And like I said before, before if someone's fake this story, that may be a bigger story than the Roscoe White story. Why? The paper made an the truth. Three years after the murders of President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, 18 material witnesses died. Six by gunfire, three in motor accidents, two by suicide, one from a cut throat, one from a karate chop to the neck, 
three from heart attacks, and two from natural causes. An actuary engaged by the London Sunday Times concluded that on November 22, 1963, the odds against these witnesses being dead by February 1967 were 100,000 trillion to one. Another witness Larry Howard told me about says Lee Harvey Oswald was a good friend of his. The witness, Ron Lewis, says Oswald told him a man was being trained to kill the president and would be positioned in the Dallas Police Department through Jack Ruby's connections. Lewis, who worked for Oliver Stone on the movie JFK, has written a book about Oswald. In it, he writes, when Lee told me that Roscoe White was going to be the assassin, I laughed and said something like, Indeed, Lee, a man named Roscoe is going to kill the president? What a funny name for an assassin. Lewis's book, Flashback, The Untold Story of Lee Harvey Oswald, was released to bookstores just last week. Our exclusive series, JFK, The West Texas Connection, will be back in a few short weeks. In the meantime, our research continues. Live from the Permian Basin's 24-hour news leader, this is Big Two News. If I could have uh, had my way, I would have liked to have seen him be president. He would have made a great president, but beyond that, he served his country and his state with enormous distinction, and we are all very proud to have known him. Former President Richard Nixon is one of many political leaders in Austin today, remembering former Texas Governor John Connolly. But while many are paying tribute to the late governor, some believe his death could shed new light on the most famous murder mystery in the history of our country, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy almost 30 years ago. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Becky Neighbors. Former Governor Connolly died Tuesday of respiratory problems. He was 76. It was November 22, 1963, in Dallas, when Governor Connolly was seriously wounded in the assassination of President Kennedy. Till the day he died, bullet fragments remained in Connolly's body. These bullet fragments have federal and state officials debating, debating the question over whether they should be removed from the body. Now, some believe the pieces could be the last missing piece to the puzzle as to who really killed JFK. Here are comments from Connolly's brother, a Dallas FBI agent, and the Dallas District Attorney about this question. Well, they would uh, they would have to approach someone other than me because I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't give it the time of day really uh, to to even ask Nelly to permit this to be done. Uh, and even if I did, I don't think that uh, you know it would be forthcoming at all. Well, I think it would be very helpful to the American public and to the. Uh, to the overall resolution of, of the Kennedy assassination if we could undertake a procedure to recover that evidence. This office does not intend to do anything about recovering the fragments from the body of John Connolly. Last month in my series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, I interviewed the director of the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, Larry Howard. It is Mr. Howard who has written a letter to Governor Ann Richards and others asking that the bullet fragments be removed. Howard and other researchers believe the pieces could disprove the single bullet theory of President Kennedy's assassination. We hope to hear from Mr. Howard via telephone during a live interview. We are trying to get that set up right now. He has been inundated by reporters from all over the country uh, trying to speak with him. We have been on the phone with him earlier and are trying to talk to him concerning 
his letter. But right now, it's Midlander Ricky White who says his father was one of multiple shooters that fateful day in Dealey Plaza when Kennedy was gunned down. Uh, Ricky is here tonight with me. And what do you think about Mr. Howard's letter asking that those bullet fragments be removed from Governor Connolly's body, Ricky? I believe it would be a perfect opportunity to take that, to take consideration of my father's involvement in the JFK. All right. Now, for those who did not get to see uh, JFK, the West Texas Connection, a series of exclusive reports we did here only last month here on Big Two, refresh, refresh their memory, our viewers' re memory, of why you believe your father was involved. Well, back in 1981, I'd found a diary that had belonged to my father that took many years to be able to, to come to a point and to realize that my father was involved in the JFK. In May of 88, the FBI took me serious, had came in and, and uh, interrogated two men in the town, uh, then late, shortly went into involvement into the safety deposit box. All right, if Mr. Howard and other researchers have their way and they are able to have these bullet fragments removed from the late governor, uh, what do you think could come from all of that? Well, it could be a good stepping stone to my father's story and the fact that, that we're trying to, to, uh, to get people involved in my father's story to help come out the truth of the JFK. All right. Thank you very much, Ricky, for being with us this evening. Okay. And as we've said, we will try to have more reports at JFK, the West Texas Connection. Uh, in weeks to come, we hope we are re researching some more information and hope to have some more stories for you later on. Now, uh, let's go to a break. We'll be right back. Hopefully, we can go to Mr. Howard live in Dallas. Maybe not, but we'll keep trying. Stay with us. All right, uh, hopefully we do have this live interview. Uh, Mr. Larry Howard, he is the director of the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. It is Mr. Howard who wrote this letter to uh, Governor Ann Richards and others asking that bullet fragments be removed from uh, former late Governor uh, John Connolly's body. Mr. Howard, I, I hope you're there on the telephone. Can you tell me about reaction to your letter so far there in Dallas? Well, the reaction has been uh, basically worldwide. Pretty much so, everybody agrees that we're doing the right thing, except the Conley family. They refuse to do this. And they buried him this afternoon, and the fragments are still there. All right, Mr. Mr. Howard, can you tell me any reaction from the FBI or others? As yeah, a matter of fact, I just heard the FBI comments. Uh, they wanted the bullet fragments removed also, which is kind of unusual. I certainly don't want the FBI handling this uh, evidence again, but uh, their statement was that, yes, they would like the bullet fragments removed also. All right. Now, I don't really have time to sit here and read this letter. Uh, we did receive a fax copy of the letter that you sent to the governor, and who, who else did you send this letter to, first of all? Well, I sent it to the Houston uh, Medical Examiner's Office. I sent it to the Dallas DA's office. Okay, if you could uh, summarize what you say in the letter. I, I don't want to sit here and read it. Can you just pretty much summarize what you said in it? Well, we're certainly uh, sympathizing with the family at the time of, of John Conley's loss, but we stated that we felt that the, uh, the, the evidence in the case, the fragments in his wrist, would prove that the single bullet theory is, it doesn't exist, which I don't think it ever did anyway. Uh, that was our point, but we also stated that uh, Governor Conley now has one last opportunity to tell us even more than he was able to in life and prove for us and for history that he not only told the truth, but he was absolutely right. He himself said he was not hit by the bullet that hit John Kennedy. All right, Mr. Howard, are you representing uh, many researchers by sending out this letter? Is this just you or who? No, actually, uh, Dr. Sarah Wack, one of the top pathologists in the world, and myself uh, sent the letter to Ann Richards and the other people. I would have not done this probably on my own without Dr. Sarah Wack's uh, support. All right, well, right now it doesn't look like it's going to happen for you folks who, who want the bullet fragments re removed from um, the late governor's body. So where do you go from here? Well, we are now in the process of retrieving the medical records of possibly the autopsy of uh, Governor Connolly, uh, records in the past months and years, maybe x-rays of the wrist. Uh, there's a bullet fragment still in the chest cavity and also one in his left thigh. So we're going to request that we uh, have access to all those medical records. Mr. Howard, thank you. Thank 
Why. This is the story of my father, Roscoe Anthony Why. It's the main incident that convinced me that my father was involved in the Kennedy assassination was in 1985. It was 1982 when I had found a diary at my grandparents' house on West Houston Street. This trunk stayed in there under key and lock and took these other trunks that were on top of it off and reached down there and grabbed it and had pulled it outside. And had had my wife, head was back there and she had noticed it too. And then, and then when I dusted it off, I knew for a fact it was my father's football. Because it had Roscoe A. White and it had his military number on the bottom of it. And automatically, I opened it up, and, and, I, and inside this footlocker was my father's original military uh, records, which are probably about this thick. Inside there, too, was a lot of men burial that had involved the Kennedy assassination. It's the very first thing that I noticed. When the first thing that I, when I opened the trunk, sitting on top was this black book. It, to me, it looked like a Bible. You know, it was that thick, but it had a little lip that locked over it. And I, and I thought maybe that it was a Bible at first, because my father was, I knew that he, he believed in God, never went to church, and I just thought that it was a Bible that he had left behind. And, and I stuck it all in the suitcase and carried it home. And then after I'd gotten home, and I believe after I started looking through it, I realized that this wasn't a Bible, this was a, my father's diary. And he was black with gold trim around it and had a little lip came over and had a little lock in it, you know, you could push it, and it had a little snap in there and locked it. It was about this high, about this wide, about this thick, and I would say that it had a probably about 400 pages in it. Every, there was, you know, it had lines all the way down, it didn't have dates, and it was completely open. Okay, so it was not pre-printed? It wasn't pre-printed. My father would state each day that he would enter each, each thing that would happen that day. And after each one of those days, he would start another day, you know, and then another day, and then whatever was in that day. And it started in 1957. The last entry would have been two weeks prior to his death in September, 71. But I thought by reading this diary that I would be able to know my father, what type of person he was, how he thought, um, what his morals were. And it was until 1985 where I came apart through the diary where my father was involved in the Kennedy assassination. How many pages of the diary were devoted to the... Just the assassination. More than any uh, notation in the whole diary. It was completely one whole full page on one side and another full on the other page. So it was two pages of documentation of the Kennedy assassination on November 22, 1963. And the only thing that it ever mentioned on the, the previous page, it was that they had met, my father had met with somebody prior before the next day. You, you wouldn't even, you would never even know in your life how I felt when I, when I read that. I mean, words can even say it. Because you're talking a man that I loved and treasured and respected. What do you feel his motivation was, based on the diary, based on him, for, for the assassination? He was convinced through other people that, that he was a national security threat or a communist ally trying to you know, invade the United States in his own ways and had convinced my father that this man had to be uh, taken out. In the diary, it never stated that he paid, was paid a dime. The only thing that was ever in the diary that he did have a safety deposit box and had money in it. And I had a receipt, which proven to me that there was $100,000 in Woodwood State Bank. I believe that that $100,000 was probably not only the Kennedy assassination, but other involvements my father was prior in his life. I really do. There's no way that that man could ever had $100,000 in the bank making $800 a month. And it'd take a lot of years to save $100,000. I just remember that the 21st of November, him and three other men had met the day before. Everything was fine. Uh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And the entry, as the entry started out is that, that my position was the man behind the stockade fence. Parentheses, Mandarin. Mandarin? Mandarin. Okay. 
man that was in the book depository slash was Lebron. The man that was in the record building was Saul. Yeah, it stated that Lebanon had got into the book depository by heating an air conditioning crew that had worked beside the building. So he was dressed as an air conditioning worker? I believe he was. And yeah. Saul had worked for the Dallas cleaning or crew at the time. It was a janitorial service that Dallas had at the time. But is there any identification as to the names of these? No, I don't know the names of them. So what I know about the diary I can place, you know, Oswald as being the person that he, he admits that uh, never fired any shots that day. And uh, he had met up with an officer in Oak Cliff and had got in his car. And from that point there, they had gone by a room and house where they were respectfully to pick this man up to go to Redford Field. And this man was? This man was Lee Harvey Oswald, and the man, the officer, would be J.D. Tippett. From after they had left the room and house, and had, he had mentioned in the diary that, that this officer had honked twice, he was scared that it would blow, blow a scene. And he was still in a frantic and had ran to the nearest store. Now, it, who, who ran this stuff? This officer had went in and made a phone call and had came back outside, got in the car, they wind up going to the rendezvous place. The man that they were supposed to pick up was standing there waiting on them. He got in the car. They were rushing off the Redbird Field. For the street that they were on, uh, Oswald had jumped out of the car two blocks before my father shoots officer at Tampa Pattern. And he doesn't stay. He gets out of the car. After Oswald gets out of the car, he states that he just shot an officer at 10 and 5. Did he say when Oswald got out of the car? Two blocks before he shot Officer Tippett at 10 and 5. My mother had worked for Jack Ruby for three weeks in September of 1963. And through her relationship of working there at the Carousel Club, she had overheard Jack Ruby and my father through a crack in the door that uh, they were conspiring. conspiring back in September, the plot of killing of John F. Kennedy. In the summer of 1990, right here at the JFK Assassination Information Center, Ricky White released this story about his father, Roscoe White. We at the JFK Assassination Information Center believe that a formal investigation should be started as soon as possible to determine the validity of these charges. However, no one in power be it on a state level, local level, or federal level, has ever investigated these charges. We feel that the American people and Ricky White have a right to know the truth about the possible involvement of his father in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy.